I think a lot of people overthought it. Um, it's really just an arithmetic problem in some ways and just working with numbers. So we're looking at two different kinds of reactions here. We're looking at the hydrogenation of benzene. It's an ugly benzene. Three equivalents of H2 to cyclohexane. And then the equivalent form for the four member ring, cyclobutadiene to H2. Okay, and so the first, I'm just going to kind of, I'm going to kind of answer this, the problem on the exam in kind of a non chronologic way. But I'm just going to write some numbers down. All right, so you, know, you should calculate that the enthalpy of this hydrogenation is around 206 kilojoules per mole. I think most people got that. Some people pick the liquid numbers for the formations instead of the gas ones. Um, so that only changes your numbers a little bit. You can still solve this problem just fine, but some people did pick the wrong numbers. Some people also picked the 298. This is at 2 t equals 298. Some people picked the zero Kelvin numbers, which is also fine, but they'll just be slightly different. And the enthalpy of this reaction is quite a bit larger. So uh, let me find it real quick. Yeah, it's, so depending on what values you use, if you use the experimental number I give you, this is 449.37 kilojoules per mole. Some people notice that ATCT also gives an enthalpy of formation for cyclobutadiene, and that gives a slightly different number. Um, I forget what it is. I didn't write it down. Um, but anyway, we'll just use this number for now. Okay, so the important thing to note is that these three double bonds, again, let's remember there are three double bonds, which is equivalent to six pi electrons. This has two double bonds, which is equivalent to four pi electrons. Is that these bo double bonds are equivalent, right? So I, what you would think is that on average, in benzene, each of the double bonds releases a third of this energy, right? So the delta H per double bond is minus 206 divided by 3, which is um, um, about 68. About six, minus 69 kilojoules per mole. Nice number. And, and of course, you can divide this one by 2. The double bond is that's minus 449 divided by 2, which is minus 224, roughly, kilojoules per mole. And what I wanted you to do is to compare these to, the, to our references. So our references for cyclohexane, or for benzene, is cyclohexane to cyclohexane. And our reference for this is the equivalent four-member ring, cyclobutene to H2, right? So uh, with H2 to give you cyclobutane. Right, so the idea is, is that I kind of the, the naive assumption is that if benzene has nothing special going on, that the enthalpy of hydrogenation of benzene will be three times that of cyclohexene. Right? There are six member rings, you've got one double bond here, you've got three, they're all equivalent, so this would be, you would expect three times that. And the answers are quite a bit different, what you find is that the enthalpy of this reaction is minus 118, roughly kilojoules per mole, and this one is minus 133. Already, we can notice that there's a difference, right? We expect a double bond in a six-member ring to release 118 kilojoules per mole. But in fact, in benzene, they only release 69, right? So that means that it takes this difference more energy to break the benzene double bonds. Right, so the extra excess energy required to hydrogenate a benzene double bond is minus 118 minus minus 69, or 118 minus 69, however you want to think about it. And that's, uh, what it was, 38, 48, 49, roughly, 49, roughly 49 
let's just say it's roughly 50. Roughly minus 50 kilojoules per mole. Right? So it takes an extra 50 kilojoules per mole to hydrogenate a benzene double bond. And this is our aromatic stabilization. Right? The bonds on average in benzene, the double bonds on average in benzene are 50 kilojoules per mole stronger than our reference, which is a single double bond in cyclohexane. So now let's look at, at, at uh, the butene case. In the butene case, we have the opposite case. Right? Our, our cyclobutadiene releases 224 kilojoules per mole per bond, but cyclobutene only releases 133. So this releases an extra 90 right, or so. Right? So for benzene, cyclobutadiene, the excess energy is minus 224, uh, let me change that, sorry, let me do the same order, minus 133 minus, minus 224, which is, um, uh, geez, I can't do this number in my head. Um, is anyone really good at math? It's like 90, right? It's roughly 90, 89 or something like that. No, I'll just do it, that's okay. 224 minus 133. 91, I was close enough. All right, notice that the sign is opposite, right? So benzene's double bonds on average release 50 kilojoules per mole less, but cyclobutadiene releases 91 more, which means that each of the cyclobutadiene double bonds are 91 kilojoules per mole weaker than the equivalent reference, which is cyclobutene. So this is the destabilization of cyclobutadiene. Let me make sure those numbers are correct. I think they are. Yeah, 50, 91, yeah, 91. Okay, so the important note is, is that Benzene stabilization is just due to aromaticity. Right? The fact that you have six pi electrons in conjugated bonds in a planar ring contributes 100% of this stabilization. Right? There's no ring strain in benzene. Six member rings. have no appreciable ring strain. All right, so that extra energy is all aromaticity. But in cyclobutadiene, we have an additional problem, which is that the bonds, carbon-carbon bonds, are 90 degrees. Right? Carbon does not like being 90 degrees. So you, you have to, there's some added energy destabilization in those bonds due to the fact that you've got to bend them 90 degrees for them all to connect in cyclobutadiene. Right? That's the ring strain. Right? So cyclobutadiene destabilization is due to anti-aromaticity, right? We, we, but it's also it's a, it's a sum of the anti-aromaticity plus the ring strain. There's two contributors. Okay, and so I wrote that the ring strain is plus 33 kilojoules per mole more unstable per sp2 carbon in the ring. There are four, so the total ring strain is 33 times four, which is 132. Okay, so let's go over here. This is per double bond. So the total destabilization of cyclobutadiene is 91 times 2, right? Because there's two double bonds. All right, and that is equal to the anti aromaticity 
plus the ring strength. So the anti-aromaticity is equal to 91 times 2 minus the ring strain, which is 132. Right? And so this is 180, which is 182 minus 132, which is 50 kilojoules per mole. So the total anti-aromatic energy for this is for cyclobutadiene is 50 kilojoules per mole, but the total aromatic stabilization of Benzene is 50 times 3. Which is minus 150 kilojoules per mole. Right, so then so we have 150 kilojoules per mole total for benzene stabilization and 50 kilojoules per mole anti-aromaticity destabilization for cyclobutadiene. And then I ask you to divide these by the number of pi electrons, right? So this is so the real number that you're comparing is 150 divided by 6 for benzene versus 50 divided by 2 for cyclobutadiene. Right? And 150 divided by 6 is 30. Is right, that right? 30 times? No. No, it's not. It's 25. And here it's 25. They're equivalent. Roughly equivalent. Okay, so the answer, the, I, I would have, so on the final question, when I ask you which is the bigger contributor, I would either accept that they're equivalent or that anti aromaticity is the weaker contributor. Because the important thing to note, and some people noted this on their exam, is that the enthalpy of formation here for cyclobutadiene had a really, really big error bar. It's on the order of 50, 47 kilojoules per mole. So if you propagate that here, the error is roughly on the order of 47, so you can't really tell. Now, if the, I think one or two people in the class, they use the, the number, the enthalpy of formation for cyclobutadiene from ATCT, which is a lower number, and if you use that number, you end up calculating that the anti-aromaticity is negligible completely. And in fact, that's the, in fact, that's what, that's the current assumption about this molecule is that the idea of Huckel's rule, the idea of an, or aromaticity and anti-aromaticity, we'll learn this next semester, is, is, a, is an approximation. Okay, so it, it, it makes a lot of assumptions about the molecule. And we'll talk about those assumptions right now, but it makes assumptions. And, but it doesn't, account for, it doesn't account for what we call second order effects, higher order corrections. And when you account for higher order corrections and you account for the fact that there is ring strain in the cyclobutadiene, what you find is, in fact, for this molecule, that the fact that the, mo the bonds are conjugated actually kind of stabilizes the molecule or makes no difference at all. And the thing that really drives the instability of cyclobutadiene is the ring strength. Right? And so that was kind of the conclusion I was getting to, that anti-aromaticity is not as major as aromaticity. Aromaticity is a, is a real effect. Right? The benzene shows that. But in fact, in cyclobutadiene, it's a much more complicated system. And so um, you can't really tell if anti-aromaticity plays a big role. What you find is that it's, contribute, it's about the same order of magnitude as the ring strain. Um, or rather, it's basically zero and the ring strain dominates. Um, so some people answered that. Some people said, and, and I, of course I didn't take points off, some people said that aromaticity was a bigger effect, but that's because their numbers were wrong in previous questions, and I didn't take off points for error that you got on other problems. So. Uh, but that's the end conclusion, that aromaticity is either equivalent to the anti-aromaticity or, or the aromaticity is much stronger. Either one's an acceptable answer. Any questions about that? Yes? Um, the last step there, when you um, were dividing the 150 and the 50. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, sorry, this is 4, too. Oh, okay. So. Yeah, that's my problem. Sorry, this is 12, roughly 13. Yeah, so let's see. So actually, I'm wrong. So. Yeah, in general, you should get that anti-aromaticity is weaker, is a weaker effect, destabilizing effect, than aromaticity is a stabilizing effect. Sorry, I apologize for that. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So that was problem one. Problem two is just a derivation. I won't go through it. If you're interested in answering some questions, you want some questions answered about it, we can talk about it after class. 
Um, I really like these conceptual questions. Um, I think the final will have a question similar to this, but it'll be on kinetics and equilibrium. Um, of course, it won't be as long as an N is involved, since I have a time constraint. But I like these logic puzzles, and so I, I imagine the final will be somewhat similar to this, in terms of, in terms of flow, if you will. Unless you guys really want multiple choice, I'll give you multiple choice example. Can multiple choice be where you went to college? <laughs> oh, my, uh, multiple choice about me? Yeah. No. That'll be in my next class, which is the, the me class. I teach about me. I didn't see that on the sign up. No, no, it's not yet. I'm getting it approved. Is that a required course? Uh, yeah, for Nate studies it is. Okay, okay. It's the new independent study major of the school. Oh, exciting. Is that a sub sub section of chemistry? Uh, no. Um, okay, where would I find that in registration? Yeah. I don't think I'd put it in chemistry. Like an emphasis, of, like so. If you did like chemistry with an emphasis in this, you can like do a sub emphasis. In um, I think I'd like to put my class in philosophy. Oh. Yeah. Or political science. Philosophy, I think. No, I like it. Is it is neat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, by the way, if you guys want to spend more time with me, I am teaching an honors book club next semester. If you're taking it here in the honors program, honors 3000, first session with me. We're going to be reading a book about physics and math. Much more interesting than that, that, that description. Okay, so, all right, so I've wasted enough time. Um, I want to. Last class we did equilibrium in a very simple way. Right? We, we derived the equilibrium constant by looking at a reaction. You don't have to draw this. But we don't have to? Oh, you've already drawn it a million times. I just wanted to put it up on the board. The one time I don't draw it's going to be like the question of the equilibrium. We'll see a lot of diagrams like this in the next couple of weeks. And what we showed was if this is our products, energy and this is our reactants, right, that the, the Gibbs free energy of the reaction is the energy difference between the two wells, delta G star, right, and we, we did some math, right, we assumed, assumed we've reached equilibrium, which means steady state concentrations a single temperature and ideal gas for the gas law and we come up with that the the delta G star is minus RT when K where K is the equilibrium All right, but the, the, the thing that, so that's really nice, right? We can measure, if we can measure ratios of, of products, right? Concentrations of products over reactants, we know what delta G is. But what we've, but the assumptions we've made are somewhat quite limiting here, right? We've assumed steady state concentrations, which means this reaction has gone to completion, right? We haven't got the kinetics yet, but as we'll learn, this could mean that we might wait 10 million years, right? Something to go to steady state might take a very, very long time. And, and that's not very ideal for us, right? And it's also assumed that the concentrations are statistical, right? That everything is weighted relative to delta G at our given temperature, right? And that might not be that helpful for us either, right? Maybe we want to do a reaction and we want to monitor the products, right? Maybe we start with just reactants and we want to monitor the products. And we ultimately want to measure delta G. But if it takes 10 million years, we're never going to be able to me measure delta G by measuring the equilibrium constant. So we need to find a way to track. Let me write this down. We need a way to track our progress towards equilibrium. as a function 
of, let's say, time. Right? Right? We're not going to really use time. We'll come up with a different value for time. Maybe a function of the number of products or, or the number, the moles of products and reactants. Because we might, we might run a reaction and we're never going to be able to reach equilibrium because it's going to take forever, but we might get really close to it. Right? The, the system might fluctuate back and forth, but we need to get some information out of it. And so that's what we're going to tackle today. We're not going. We're going to look at how equilibrium. We're going to do the math about equilibrium as we approach steady state, right? as we approach infinity time, time at infinity. Right. Remember the assumption here is is that time is going to infinity. Right. But we've let the system evolve as long as possible until everything equilibrates. And of course, we don't always have that luxury. Right. So we should look at to see how we can understand equilibrium as a function as we approach it. Right? How, know, how do we know if we're close to equilibrium or not? Right? So that's kind of our tackle today, what we're going to tackle today. So what I'm going to do is introduce, we're going to look at a, a very simple, a standard reaction. So consider the following reaction. We're going to take a and B and equilibrate it with our products C and D. All right, and we need to give them stoichiometric coefficients. So I'm going to call the stoichiometric coefficient nu, or nu sub A, nu sub B, nu sub C, nu sub D, where nu sub K is the stoichiometric coefficient. for component K. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to track this reaction in terms of the moles of each product. Okay, so let's say we start we start with we want to track the moles of A, track the moles of B, Track the moles of C and track the moles of D. Of course, they're at T equals zero. They're going to be at some initial point. So we'll call that N sub A naught, N sub B naught, N sub C naught, and N sub D naught. All right, and then let's, let's allow the reaction to occur. Okay? So let's say it happens once, it might happen twice, it happens some number of times x. Right, so let's allow, allow the reaction to occur x times. Right. And so how do the moles change every time the reaction occurs x times? Well, every t we start with initial moles. Every time this reaction starts it goes to, right, every time it starts from A to B and converts to C and D, we're going to lose nu sub A times X moles. Right? If nu sub A is 1, right, every time this reaction occurs, we lose 1 mole equivalent of A. And so on and so forth. Right? We're going to lose nu sub V moles of, of B. And then, of course, we're going to gain these, right? So we're going to have a plus here for C. And we're going to have a, a, a D here, or a plus for D. Right. So the units of X here, units of X are, are, are unitless. Right. But, they're, but overall, they're proportional to moles because we multiply it by moles. Right. Stoichiometric coefficients have units of moles. Right. So this should all make sense. Right. We lose some number of moles of A, B, and we gain some moles of C and D. Okay, so now let's think about it at a given point in time. How does a how do the moles of a, b, and c and d change? Right? So let's freeze system at some time. What is the instantaneous change in moles for each species? Okay, so what we want to calculate 
is DNA dx, right? Freeze it in time. What's the slope of moles with respect to time or x? And so on and so forth. All right, so all we have to do is take a derivative of these with respect to x. So that's easy enough. This one's minus VA x. Or sorry, the x goes away. All right, the x goes away. All right, this, this is a constant. It's gone. Right, you take a derivative of it. There's no, right, that's zero. And then the x goes away because it's linear. So you're just left with the, the negative stoichiometric coefficient. C is plus new C. D and D is plus new D. Right, and so we can multiply both sides by dx, which says that the instantaneous change in moles is minus VA dx minus VB dx, new B dx, excuse me, plus new C dx, plus new D dx. Okay, so now we know how the moles change as a function of time. Right? We're using x as our, our function of time. Right? Instead of using time, we don't know anything about time because we don't know any kinetics. We just know that this reaction is going to occur some number of times, and we mount, monitor that with x. Right? Just as a reminder, I haven't said this. If you have the book, you'll, they'll call this extent of reaction. X is called the extent of reaction. They use it, uh, Atkins uses a different symbol. And I hate the symbol that they use, so I'm using X here. The only problem with X is that you confuse it with mole fraction. But we'll get, we, we, it won't be a big deal. So now what I want to do is we know that the system that gives it free energy difference of the system at equilibrium is delta G star. Right? We know that the system, as it evolves, delta G will end up being this value at the end. But if it's not, we're not at the completion, if the result has, if the system hasn't, re hasn't equilibrated yet, our Gibbs energy or free energy of our system will not be this. It'll be some greater number. And so let's look at that for a second. I am going to, yeah, do it right here. So what we'll use is the fundamental equation of thermodynamics. which says that the change in Gibbs energy, total change in Gibbs energy, is equal to minus the entropy times dt plus the molar volume dp. And then there's a term across all the components of the molecule, a, b, c, d, of the chemical potential of that species times its change in moles. All right, we can change G by changing the temperature. We can change G by changing the pressure. Or we can change G by changing the number of moles. Right, that's the whole point of chemical potential. Okay, and so in our system, in, in our reaction, we're going to freeze it, temperature and pressure. pressure right, we're going to do a chemistry reaction at room temperature and room pressure, or whatever temperature we want. All right, so these go away. Constant T constant P. All right, so, so G, we'll, we'll deal with Gibbs energy and equilibrium as we change temperature and pressure later. But right now, we're not worried about that. We're worried about just moles. All right, so Gibbs energy is only dependent on the change in moles. But notice that we have a new equation for the change in moles. All right, D and K, it's just these terms right here. So we can express the change in energy as a function of the, of the extent of their reaction. Right? So that means that dg is equal to this sum right here. So that's going to be the chemical potential of A, mu A minus, sorry, there's a minus here, dx minus the chemical potential of B times nu B, dx plus mu C mu c dx plus mu d db dx. Okay, so Gibbs energy changes 
proportional to the number of moles in our system, right? The stoichiometric ratios, and it all changes depending on the chemical potentials. How much desire each molecule, each component has to change its number of moles to, to change, right? Right. If 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 mu a and mu b are really are really large, right? If if the chemical potential of our reactants is really large and wants to they want to convert, then dg is going to be very negative, right? Because they have negative signs on the Likewise, if, if, if the system is reactant favored and the products really want to convert to reactants, then mu C and mu D are going to be really large and the system is going to want to go backwards, right? And, and that means delta G in this case is very positive, right? which means it's reactant favored, okay? So we don't really care about those numbers, mu A, mu B, and mu C, and mu D, but we, we, should, we should consider them because they kind of give you, they weigh how strong one react, how strong the transformation of one component to another is. Right? The ratio of mu A, mu B versus mu C, mu D tell you how reactant or product favor the reaction is at a given point X. Okay, so what that means is, is that Gibbs energy, we can just divide everything by x. So, so Gibbs energy as a function of the number of reactions that occur, the extent of reaction at constant temperature and pressure, is equal to um, the chemical potentials of the products times their stoichiometric coefficients. Oh, I'm sorry, this is C. Right, this is the products minus the stoichiometric coefficients and the chemical potentials of the reactants. If we look at the units of this equation. Is it not negative mu A? Because aren't they already, aren't they negative? Well, I, I factored the negative out, oh. right? They're all sum and then I factored the negative out and then flipped the order so it's products minus reactants. Here I have minus, so here I have minus reactants plus products, and here I have reactants minus products. Or sorry, products minus reactants, they're equivalent. So I just factored out the minus sign. All right, so this is, this is the, uh, right, so, so let's think about the units for just a second. X is unitless, so the units of this derivative is energy. It's just a change in energy. Right? And so that means that this entire thing has units of energy per mole. It's just in terms of the energy. And you can show that this is just the, the change in Gibbs at any point x. Right? This is the Gibbs energy of the system along the reaction. So it's not an equilibrium necessarily. We'll see that. Right? If it's equilibrium, then we add this little star to it. Right, but the, but the only time we get this delta G is when the reactants and the products have equilibrated. Right, we haven't gotten there yet. So delta G over here will eventually be equal to this at equilibrium. So let me erase some of those here. I'm gonna leave my leave this here. Okay, so, so delta G of the reaction is delta G star plus RT lin. And we can use mole fraction here if we want, but I'm just going to use partial pressures. So it's the partial pressure that, that gives energy of a, of a specific of a specific component going to be the Gibbs free energy of formation of that component plus RT len times the partial pressure divided by a standard pressure. I'll write that out. This is the partial pressure. All right, it's a concentration in terms of pressures. And this is typically one bar. Right? You just pick some standard state, which is one bar, usually. We can also write, because it has the same units, we can do this for chemical potential. The chemical potential at any point K for any component K is the standard chemical potential 
plus RT blend times its partial pressure divided by a standard state. Okay, so what we can do now is take this expression, these mu's, and express them in terms of the standard chemical potential or the standard energy plus the partial pressure. So delta G of our reaction at any point is going to be the stoichiometric coefficient. I'm just going to do the algebra out. So again, we're plugging this equation into here. And I'm just going to do the algebra out for you. So again, it's the standard chemical potentials of our components, products minus reactants, as always. And there's an RT term, which expresses how far we are out of equilibrium would be mu C ln times the partial pressure of C, P naught, plus mu D, partial pressure of D over P naught, minus the mu A. I'm sorry, I missed a log here. Log, partial pressure of A over P naught, minus B, the B term. But the fact of the matter is, is that we, we don't even have to worry about chemical potentials because by this definition here, this term right here, I'm going to draw it in a box instead, is just delta G star of the reaction. It's this right here. All right, so that means that delta G the current G as a function of X, or the Gibbs energy of, a, of the system, of the system is going to be its standard Gibbs energy plus RT ln, or RT times, the log, times all these logarithms. Now we can simplify this. We can simplify it by noting that we have, let me just write my log rules down just to remind you that A times log of B is equal to the log of B to the A, and that log X plus log Y is the log of X times Y, and the difference of logs is the, three, is the log of the quotient, X over Y. All right, just to remind you. All right, so we have some differences of logs, some sums of logs, and some coefficients on the outside, so we can apply these rules and simplify it. I'm going to write that one in black. And when you do that, you get, you get the partial pressures to, their stoichiometric, to the stoichiometric coefficient power, so PD over P0, PC over P0 to the V mu C squared power, PA over P0, mu sub A times PB over P naught mu sub B. Right, we call this, this term right here, it might look like, if you think about these as concentrations, right? this is the amount of partial pressure, right? your total pressure is the sum of partial pressures. This is how much, is your, how much of your total pressure of your gases is D, how much is C, how much is A, and how much is B. Right, these are concentrations, gas phase concentrations, right? So this is an equilibrium constant, right? But the, the equilibrium only occurs when delta G is equal to delta G star. So what we call this instead of an equilibrium coefficient is called the reaction quotient. Q. Right? So when does Q become K, right? So we can... And any time during the reaction, we can monitor the pressures of our substance and, and, take, and, and get our quotient. 
our equilibrium constant, if you will, our test equilibrium constant. But that, but that Q is going to be different than K because the system may be out of equilibrium. So what, well, how, does this, how does Q become K, the equilibrium constant? Well, that's when the system equilibrates. So the system reaches equilibrium. when either, these are equivalent statements, but bear with me. One is that the sum of the, par, of the, of the of the chemical potentials of the products minus the chemical potentials of the reactants is equal to zero. All right, when this whole thing right here goes to zero, the products minus the reactants goes away, right? Well, that means that the, the reactants and the products have equal desire to convert to each other, right? They don't, one's not overbalanced than the other. Right? They're equal and opposite. Right? And that's also to say that's equivalent to that the delta G of the system is equal to the delta G standard, right? This delta G, right? The delta G that we measured when we let the system go to infinity, right? Time infinity, right? This is the actual energy difference between the products and the reactants, right? So all equilibrium is, again, all we've already described what equilibrium is, right? Equilibrium is a statistical weighting between products and reactants that's weighted based on the Gibbs free energy difference between them. And what, we're, what we track during a reaction is right, delta G changes as the chemical potentials are, are, are displaced, where you might have more potential products and more potential reactants. That increases G, right? And so the system, of course, wants to go to lowest possible energy so that as it, it wants to reduce the contribution of this term, right? And so it will eventually go to equilibrium till the chemical potentials equal each other. And that means the Gibbs energy of your system at that time is equal to the actual Gibbs energy difference of the molecules. Right? You've gotten rid of the energetic contribution of reactants wanting to go to products and products going to reactants, right? the chemical potential part. Right? So in equilibrium, this whole term, dg dx at Tp, is zero. Well, that's really nice. What that means is, is that, that, that equilibrium occurs when Gibbs energy reaches a minimum, right? The slope is zero with respect to time or extent. So what we're looking for is where Gibbs reaches zero. Right? So if I were to draw that, so here we monitor the Gibbs in the reaction. And let's put here delta G star. Right? This is the energy at equilibrium. Let's say we start with just reactants. So x is 0. Gibbs is high. It is going to decrease as reactants convert to products until it reaches the minimum. And then maybe we've, we've driven the reaction too far, and you have more products than you want, than, you would, than the, the potentials would suggest. So Gibbs will increase, right? So this is equilibrium at this point, right? And this is where the energy, the slope of the energy with respect to extent is zero. And let's look at the slopes along the edges. So along this point, dg dx is greater than zero. And here dg dx is less than zero. And just to write, this is all reactants, and this is all products. So let's start here, right? At the beginning of our reaction, we just have reactants and some products, right? The slope of Gibbs with respect to the extent, right? This, again, x is the number of reactions that occur. And our starting point is all reactants. There are no products, right? 
The slope of Gibbs with respect to the number of reactions with respect to x is negative here. So that means that at this point, the system wants to continue to react because g decreases right, as, as x increases. Right? As x increases, the Gibbs energy decreases. Right? And so that means that it's less than 0, which means further reaction, forward reaction, is spontaneous. Right, the slope is negative. That means as you, in, as you go through the reaction, the Gibbs energy decreases. Right? And we know that a negative Gibbs energy change is a spontaneous change. Likewise, on the other side, we have the opposite case. The reverse reaction is spontaneous. Right? Because if we, if, we make, if we make more products here, Gibbs energy increases. That's not spontaneous. So the only spontaneous action is for it to create more reactants and go backwards. Right? So you have a balance here. On this side, the system wants to go backwards. And here, it wants to go forwards. And there's only one place where the forces are equal. And it's right there at the, at the middle, right at equilibrium. So, and, and just very quick, quickly, so if we're at this point, dg dx equals zero, this is zero at equilibrium, and this is equal to dg dx, All right, it's equal to zero. And so that means that delta g star is equal to minus RT when Q. Well, that sure looks like our equation from equilibrium, right? So at equilibrium, Q equals K. Right, so that the really cool thing about equilibrium is that we can monitor the equilibrium constant. We can just make it up with the concentrations we observe. And if, the, if this, right, this Q, and if, if Q shows up if Q tells us that the value isn't what we would expect from this delta G, then we know that the reaction has either gone too far or it hasn't completed yet. Right? We can tell whether we're on this side, the system needs to make more products to equilibrate, or we're on this side, where it needs to make more reactants to equilibrate. Right? So Q is a diagnostic tool. Right? We can measure the, but it's not an equilibrium constant. Right? The equilibrium constant only occurs when you're here only occurs at equilibrium. But we can monitor, we can look at Q, and it will tell us which side we're on, right? Because if we're on this side, where there's too many reactants, then Q will be too small, right? Q will be too small because these numbers in the denominator are large. So Q will be too small. Q, so the denominator is larger than the numerator. That means this, that you have a log of a number smaller than 1. It's negative, so delta G will be smaller than delta G star, which means the reaction wants it to move forward. Likewise, if we're in the opposite case, where the numerator is too big, the concentrations of the products are too big, then delta G will be greater than delta G star, and the system will want to go backwards. Right? So this is a really nice way to monitor reactions towards completion. If you know what delta G star should be, you can get a sense of where you are in your reaction completion by just calculating an approximate equilibrium constant from your experimental results. And that will tell you whether you're on the product side or the reactant side of equilibrium. The important distinction the thing about here is that we've, when we reach equilibrium, we've re-derived the exact results we did last class. We still get the delta G star equals minus RT ln K. Right, so we've taken, a, we've taken a system way out of equilibrium, and we've tracked it until it reaches equilibrium, and we see that the results converge to exactly what we would expect from the energy diagram. And so that's nice. Equilibrium is a nice tool for us to track the extent of our reaction. And also, as we'll see, it also allows us to uh, 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 track how the concentrations will change as we perturb the system. Right? Maybe we start removing a product. Right? Maybe we do this reaction and we remove D continuously, like we bubble D out 
of our solution, right? And we'll be able to, using this, these tools, figure out how the concentrations of A and B change as we pull D away, right? Whether the system continues to make C and D or equilibrates back, okay? And everything that has to do ultimately with the energy difference, right? The temperature and the energy difference, right? Everything is connected here. Questions? Yes? Is K a constant within the equation, or does it change depending on what um, chemicals you use? Like what it we'll changes use? depending, well, it, it, yeah, it definitely changes depending on what chemicals you use, because Q, or K, is related to delta G, which is related to the Gibbs energies of formation. Even at um, equilibrium? Yes, okay. yeah, absolutely. Let's do an example. We have time. Yeah, we have time to do an example. So maybe it'll become more clear. And, and so the next, the next lecture after this, we're going to basically just do nonstop examples. So this, this, is kind of a, this is kind of an abstract way to calculate things, but it will become more clear how practical this is once we do a problem. All right, so I'm going to have to start erasing things. I'll leave this here for now in case someone's still writing. The problem I want to do today is a classic experiment or classic reaction in atmospheric chemistry, which is to take N2O4 and decompose it, this is in gas phase of course, into NO2, two components of NO2. Okay. So we're going to use this extensive reaction technique uh, to actually calculate our equilibrium concentrations. All right, so I need to write some things down. First, we're going to start with, we're going to do this at T equals 298 Kelvin. Total pressure is one bar. All right, just normal conditions. And we're going to start with, initially, one mole of N2O4 and zero moles of NO2, okay? And the question we're going to ask is, what are the final mole fractions or mole number of moles of N2O4 and NO2, okay? So we, we start the system way out of equilibrium, and we're going to calculate where it reaches equilibrium as a function of the moles. Right, this is this is just a fancy way to do an ice chart. But we're going to use thermodynamics instead of just an ice chart to do this. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing as we did before. We're going to measure the number of moles of N2O4 with respect to the extent of reaction. All right, the moles of N2O4 initially are 1. And for, right, we lose, every time this reaction occurs, we lose one mole of N2O4. This is 1 minus x. Right, one mole equivalent goes away. We start with zero moles of NO2, and we gain two moles every time the reaction occurs. So we can write the Gibbs energy of our system with respect to x as 1 minus x times the Gibbs energy of N2O4 plus 2x the Gibbs energy of NO2. Those are, our, those are our ratios, right? 1 minus x and 2x. Okay, and we can write, now we can write g of some, of some product. g sub k is the delta gk of formation of component K plus RT ln that's partial pressure divided by standard pressure. Okay. So that means we need to find delta G formation of N2O4 and delta G of formation of NO2. So I'll take this equation and plug it into here. G of x is going to be 1 minus x times the Gibbs energy of formation star 
of N2O4 plus 2x times the Gibbs energy of formation for NO2. And then we have our RT term. So that's going to be plus 1 minus x RT ln P into O4 over standard pressure plus 2x RT ln the partial pressure of NO2 over standard, condition, standard pressure, which is just one bar. Right? And we know that the equilibrium will be reached when this is equal, right? This is equal to the same as dg dx, but this is equal to zero. But we've got a problem. This is not just a function of x, but it's also a function of the partial pressures. Right? So we need to express the partial pressures in terms of x. So that's quite easy to do. First, so let's first calculate the number of total moles which is going to be 1 minus x plus 2x, right? We've got 2x moles of our products and 1 minus x moles of our reactants. So the mole fraction of N2O4 is the moles of N2O4 divided by the total moles. And our mole fraction of NO2 is NNO2 over N total. This is 1 minus x over, this is 1 plus x, right? If you do the math, 1 plus x. 1 plus x. And this is 2x over 1 plus x. All right, those are our mole fractions. This is why I don't like using x here, because it's confusing with that, but bear with me. And of course, the, the partial pressure, partial pressure of N2O4 is the mole fraction of N2O4 times the total pressure, which is 1 bar. Right, so it's just a factor of one. You can just get rid of it. One plus x, sorry. And the partial pressure of NO2 is its mole fraction times the total pressure, which is one bar. Which is 2x over 1 plus x. Okay. So now we have everything in terms of x. Plug it in here. Again, the whole equation is equal to zero at equilibrium. We have 1 minus x times the Gibbs energy of formation of N2O4. Now we'd have to look that up, but luckily I have the values here. This value is the formation energy is 97.787 kilojoules per mole. And this one is 51.258. And I just got these from NIST. And RT, at, just an easy, just, RT at room temperature is 2.4790 kilojoules per mole at 298 Kelvin. Okay. So that gives us all the numbers we need. So we have an equation now in terms of x, which is 1 minus x times 97.787 kilojoules per mole plus 2x times 51, let me do this a different color, sorry, 51.258 kilojoules per mole. And I'll factor out RT from both of these equations plus RT, which, which is 2.4790 2 kilojoules per mole, times the logarithm of the pressure of N2O4, which is, let me do that in blank, the lin of the partial pressure. P star here is one bar, so it just goes away. So it's the lin of one minus X over one plus X plus NO2. Um, we also have a fact, yeah, 2x. Uh, did I miss something? Sorry, sorry, sorry. I apologize. I have an error here. This is 1 minus x when 1 minus x over 1 plus x plus 2x when 
2x over 1 plus x. And we have the stoichiometric coefficients on the outside. Right here, right here. All right, so now we have an equation of x that's equal to 0. We can just solve it. So when you solve numerically, x is 0.1892 at equilibrium. Okay, so we have this now. We can calculate equilibrium mole fractions. We can calculate the equilibrium constant. We know everything we need to know. So let me, let me plot x with respect to g and just show you. So if you plot x, which is a function of moles, versus g of x, which is in kilojoules per mole, 96, 98, 100. You don't have to draw this. It's just a useful graph. 0, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.8, and 1. Of course, x can't be greater than 1. Because if it were greater than 1, then the moles of N204 would be negative, right? 1 minus x. Right? So x is, varies between 0 and 1. And the graph looks like this. This. And so the, the equilibrium point is right there. Okay, so now that we know that, we can calculate the mole fractions. Right? The mole fractions are these. Right? So the mole fraction of N2O4 is 1 minus 0.1892 over 1 plus 0.892. And the mole fraction of NO2 is 2 times 0.1892 over uh, 1 plus 0.1892. So let me calculate this real quick. Telephono. One minus point one eight nine two divided by one plus one eight nine two. So this is point six eight two, and this one is. 0.318, right? And that's also partial pressures, right? He said the partial pressure is equal to the mole fraction, so the partial pressure, this is in bar, like so. OK? Right, so we know that if we start, if we start our reaction with one bar of into a 4 and we let it go to equilibrium, this product, this, this this reaction is reactant favored, right? We form more reactants than products. And we form approximately a ratio of 7 to 3. And this is the same, right? And we can calculate the equilibrium constant from this. K here is going to be P in a 2 squared divided by P in 2 4. Right. Which is point six, sorry, point three one eight squared over point six eight two. which is 0.148. Okay, so it's reactive favored, as we expected. Right? And if we were to measure Q, and we get 0.148, we know we're at equilibrium. Right? And that's bars, right? Uh, uh, so actually, it's unitless. The re so the reason why it's unitless, let's, let's look at that for a second. I didn't quite do this properly. So let me write that down as 0.148. I'm just going to write it here in the notes so I don't forget. So let's, let's look at the units of this. 
So it's actually P N204 over P star squared over P N02. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. My, my apologies. N02 and 204 over P star. So this is actually in units of, so this has units of P N02 squared. You have P squared here and P in the numerator. P N02 squared, P N204, right? Times 1 over P naught. So this has units of bar. This has units of per bar, so they cancel out. So this is in bar, and this is in bar minus one. So it's unitless, as it should be. Your, your equilibrium coefficient, I'll just write that down. K should always be unitless. Right? And it's not unitless unless you can, that's why we add these standard pressures in there, right, to make it unitless. Right? And this is equal to 0.148. I won't do the I won't do the calculation, but you can now take this value. We know that delta G is equal to minus R T ln K. All right, we can plug that in. Delta G star. So delta G star is equal to at this temperature minus 2.4790 kilojoules per mole times the logarithm of 0.148. That's our equilibrium expression. And I'll just do that math real quick. 49790 times the log of 0.148, which is equal to 4.736 kilojoules per mole. Right? And that number should be equivalent to the difference of these. Right? Remember, Gibbs energy, right, it's a state function, so we just take the Gibbs energy of formations of the products minus the reactants. Which is going to be two times, right, NO2, there's two, mol, two moles, so it's two times 51.258 minus 97.787 kilojoules per mole. And I bet you it's the same number. This is just an internal consistency check. Yeah. 4.73 kilojoules per mole. Right? Everything works out. Right? We can calculate. We can calculate equilibrium coefficients, equilibrium behavior by just doing delta G differences. Right? That's a very logical way to do it. And you can get K from this. But maybe we don't have that luxury. Maybe instead what you do is you monitor, maybe the only thing you can do, you don't know delta G, or you don't know these delta Gs, you have some unknown products, some unknown gases. You can figure out what delta G is very quickly. If you can monitor the partial pressures, you can monitor the equilibrium constant Q as a function of time. And what you should see is that, so let's think about where, what, what Q is here on this side. Right, so, so Q here is at equilibrium is 0.148. And so what is it here versus here? Well, if at x equals 0, you have no products and all reactants, so K should be x. Sorry, so Q here should be zero, right? Because the numerator is zero. And here it should be large. So K, Q here is, where you have a lot of products, is greater than one, right? So what do, we, what do we know if the reaction goes to completion? What if we were to monitor pressures as a function of time? We do time versus Q. Initially, it's zero, right, because there's no products. And it might increase high and then come back down. Maybe it oscillates like this, right, but eventually it'll converge to a number. 
Maybe it oscillates below and above. Sorry. Let me do that instead. Like that. And of course, this number is Q equals 0.148. Right? So the system is going to swing, depending on randomness, the system might, it might do this. It might fluctuate wildly and converge to our equilibrium value, KEQ. Or it might also do this. Something like this as well. Right? It may converge to it asymptotically as well. Right? It depends on the reaction. It's probably going to do that. Right? But you know that if you, if you monitor Q, if you monitor the ratio of your pressures or your concentrations as a function of time, you know that you're going to reach equilibrium when your reaction quotient basically right, equilibrium occurs. when the derivative of Q with respect to time is equal to zero. Right? That means steady state concentrations. That's all that means. Right? This, all this means is that the concentrations don't change with time significantly. This is just steady state. Right? Again, we're just doing circle, circular logic. Right? We made the assumption about the equilibrium is that everything's steady state. And then what we did is we relaxed that we relaxed that requirement and tackle the reaction at any point during the reaction, the in, in or out of equilibrium. And what we show is that equilibrium is reached. And you can monitor whether equilibrium is reached when your reaction quotient stops changing in time. Right? You don't know how we don't know how long that's going to take yet. Right? Some reactions won't will take forever. Right? And we don't know that. Kinetics are going to teach us that. Right? And we'll be able to go back, once we learn some kinetics, we'll be able to go back and learn a new way to teach equilibrium, which is we'll find is equilibrium constant is the ratio of the forward reaction rate divided by the reverse reaction rate. Okay? So right kinetics and equilibrium are connected, but the time scale at which these things happen are not clear of equilibrium. OK, so that was a lot of math. Um, so on Thursday, we'll come back to this. We'll do some more examples. Um, we'll talk about how Gibbs equilibrium changes with temperature and pressure, um, which of course is very important. We'll use the Haber-Bosch process as our motivating example. Um, that's all I got to say. You guys have a lovely day.